Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. My name is Carla, and I'm up here with Chris and Ashley and my friends, the band. And it's so good to be with you. And if you're watching online, we are so glad you are joining us here today. Hey, this is our time where we are gonna jump into worship, and we just do that by singing. This is our chance to press pause on our week and think about all the good that God has in store for us. Um, to have a moment of gratitude, that is when we lift ourselves out of our anxiety. We see the joy that is before us and all of the good things around us. And we can do that in worship. So we're gonna do that now. Would you please stand with us? And let's lift our voices. Let's sing out to our God. Here we go. Thank you. 
Jesus said these words to his followers, and I believe that he has the same invitation for us today. He said, come and follow me. He didn't say, come and follow me when you're perfect. He didn't say, come without any mistakes or struggles. He simply said, come and follow me just as you are. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he isn't hard to find. Jesus never said, go searching for me and you will find me. But he did say, seek me and you will find me. When we search for something, it's about looking and hunting for something that is lost. But when we seek something, it's about pursuing and Jesus doesn't conceal himself from us or make himself hard to find, but he does long for us to pursue him. And friends, as I look back throughout my life, Jesus has always been there. Through seasons of joy, seasons of hurt and loss. And I never had to go looking for him, but I did need to seek him in order to be changed by him. I needed to pursue who he is and the plan that he had for my life. And when I did that, everything changed. Everything changed. And this next song that we're gonna sing, it says the words, I don't have to search to find you. You are not hidden. You are not distant. I don't need to fight for your attention. You don't need perfection. And I'm so thankful that Jesus doesn't make it complicated for us to come to him, but it does require action on our part to take steps toward him. And so my hope for us today, whether we're in this room or you're watching online, wherever you're at in this life, my hope is that we would know in this moment that Jesus loves you, he is for you, and he is with you in this moment. And during this song, would we worship him for all that he is, for all that he has done, and would we seek and pursue him knowing that when we do, something special will happen. Everything changes when we do. So let's sing this together to pursue him together and worship him.
together today. God, we thank you for that truth, that incredible gift of nearness that you give us. We thank you, God, that no matter what we walk through these doors carrying today, God, that you see us. You know every piece of our story. And God, you are there with us. Your word tells us that you're closer than the air that we breathe. So today, would you help us to know, God, that we are never alone. I pray that you would speak to us today, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive everything that you have for us. God, we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, thanks for singing, everybody. You can go ahead and take a seat. Hey, welcome to Eagle Brook Online. So good to be with you this weekend. My name is Jeff. I'm the online campus pastor. And this week, I was chatting with our online groups pastor, Nick, and he told me that it's time to start recruiting small group leaders for the fall. I told Nick, say it ain't so. I'm not sure I can even bring myself to do that. There's still so much summer left, and yet, here we are, but at least we're talking about something cool. Small groups are the lifeblood of our online community. It is where you can meet incredible people from all over the world and grow in your relationship with God. And we believe that lasting transformation happens best in community. And to be totally honest, as an online pastor, I think often about our online attenders and I wanna invite you into attention that I've felt over the last few online group sessions. We've had a massive amount of interest, so much so that our online groups fill up in just the first couple of days of the directory being open. We have felt this mismatch of the amount of people who want to lead a group to the amount of people that want to attend a group. And why this matters is because we have online attenders wanting to possibly take their first step in getting connected. They've mustered up enough courage to put themselves out there, they check the directory, and our groups are full, and that feels bad. I will say that these are great problems to have though. We have too many people who wanna be part of our online community, but my hope for online is that this will be a place for people to experience God through community and that there will be a place for everyone. And why I'm telling you this is because for the last five weeks, we have averaged more than 6,000 more devices watching online than where we were at this exact same spot last year. That is potentially 6,000 more people that might want to jump in and join a group, and we need your help to provide a spot for them. I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor. Set aside your summer mindset just for a moment. I promise this will be brief. Think about the fall. Kids back in school, back to routine, back to reality. That is when our group session starts. So if you're someone who can facilitate a discussion over video chat, and you wanna help our online audience get connected and grow in their faith, We'll take care of the rest. You don't need to recruit, you don't need to teach, you don't need to create content. We have everything that you need and to let us know you're interested, simply text the word LEAD 
to 77888. Or you can always go to our website, eaglebrookchurch.com slash groups. And as you're doing that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan for today's message. Enjoy the rest of the service. What's up, Eagle Brook? I am so glad that you have joined us this weekend. I hope you've been having a good summer. My name is Ryan, and uh, I've been having a great summer, just so you know. Uh, me and my wife just celebrated 10 years of marriage this summer, so we've been having, having a lot of fun. Uh, we actually, one of the things we got to do, we got to go to the Taylor Swift concert, U.S. Bank Stadium. If you're judging me right now, just know half of Eagle Brook Church was there as well and um, saw everybody there. It was great. And uh, yeah, I've been, ha- been having a great summer. So glad you're here today. We're continuing a series that I think has been uh, extremely helpful. It's called Four Enemies of the Soul. Now, uh, maybe you're here today. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe somebody tricked you into coming to church. Glad you're here. Um, but this is what I want you to know. Uh, each and every one of us has a-, a soul. And I don't know if you knew this, but God... Regardless of where you stand with religion, God has a plan for your soul, a good plan. I've actually always loved uh, this verse uh, in the New Testament from John, uh, 3 John 1, 2. It it says this, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in hell, just as your soul prospers. And if you think about it, it's, it's, it's an amazing prayer. In fact, it's the prayer that I have for you and I today, that we would prosper that we would grow abundantly in all things, be in good health, just as our soul prospers. Have you ever thought about what it would look like to have a prosperous soul? Perhaps you've heard the song lyric before, it is well with my soul. It's the idea that you and I could be experiencing a lot of challenges and stressors and obstacles all around us, to toxic work environments, financial turmoil, or navigating health difficulties. And yet somehow, our soul remain intact. My friends, I, I believe that God wants each and every one of us to have a prosperous soul. I believe that God wants each and every one of us to have a soul that is truly at peace. Now, there are very real enemies that want to rob us of that peace. There are forces waging war against our souls every single day. And we looked at three thus far. The first enemy of our soul that we looked at was the devil. Now, sometimes we think our enemy is our spouse. Um, Sometimes we think our enemy is our kids, the IRS, um, or the Packers. Listen, we all got kinds of enemies, but you've got the wrong enemy It's the devil. There's an evil force working against you that you don't have to be afraid of because any military leader would tell you that one of the ways that you can have victory is by knowing your enemy well and the strategies that they deploy to try and defeat you. So we don't have to be afraid because we know through Scripture exactly how he works. So if you missed week one of this series, I encourage you to go back and check that out. The next enemy of the soul that we looked at was the flesh, the part of us that is weak and falls into temptation. This is the part of us that just wants to do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it, with whoever we want to do it with. And some people would call that freedom. But if you give your flesh whatever it wants, even just for a little while, you won't call that freedom. We'll call that bondage. And the flesh often craves to do things that are absolutely terrible for our soul. The next enemy of the soul we looked at last week was uh, the world itself and worldly pleasures. Uh, We, inhabitants of planet Earth, uh, we live here, but 
It's like the scripture encourages us to be here, but not get comfortable. It's like we live here, but we're supposed to stick out in some way, shape, or form. We're supposed to be a little weird. Um, I meet with a, a group of Christian philanthropists, um, and they always, uh, each year that we get together, they always share stories about how their friends just think that they're so weird because it's like, you make a ton of money to just give it away? They're like, yeah, we know we live here, but we know why we're here. You and I will constantly be bombarded with messages from the world to steer us in a direction and conform, to steer our lifestyle, to, to steer our decisions. But the Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Rome, in Romans 12, verse 2. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, did you know that there is a pattern set for you by this world on how you should date, on how you should work, on how you should spend your money, on how you should climb the ladder of success, that a lot of people in your world, in my world, may expect us to follow. But what you and I have to do is we have to consider if those patterns are indeed good for our soul. So we've got the devil, we've got the flesh, the world, and lastly this weekend, I want us to consider the last enemy of our soul, and that's the mind. For a lot of us, it's our thoughts that are keeping our souls from having the peace God desires for them. Um, did you know that on average, you and I are going to get about 6,000 thoughts per day? 6,000. Now, for some people, uh, they think 60,000 thoughts per day. That's our overthinkers. Okay, these people don't sleep. Okay, they just think through the night. Nevertheless, on average, you and I are going to have around 6,000 thoughts per day. Did you know that of the 6,000 to 60,000 thoughts we are going to think today, 80% of them are negative? 80. Uh, quick math for us, that means you and I, without intervention, are going to have anywhere from 4,800 to 48,000 negative thoughts just today. Uh, did you know that 95% of them are repetitive? Which means we could take the worst thought you're having about yourself right now, insecurities, inadequacies, uh, you name it, whatever it is, this is what you need to know. It's not new. You had that thought yesterday, but it feels brand new. But no, it's actually like five years old. You've been thinking the same thing over and over and over and over again. You and I are going to have the same negative Spotify playlist going on in our brain every single day. But now I just, I got to ask you something. How in the world are our souls supposed to get a W with that much thinking, thinking? How are we supposed to be the parents God has called us to be? How are you supposed to be the teacher God has called you to be? The spouse, the leader, the friend, the neighbor, the politician, the entrepreneur, the podcaster, the writer, the person God has called you to be with that much stinking thinking. My friends, this is why I think the Bible is genius, because I think the scriptures give us three things that our thoughts need that I believe will help us win in the battlefield of the mind. I think the first thing that, that our thoughts need is, number one, renewal. We need some new thoughts. Romans 12, verse 2, again, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But then it says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What you and I desperately need are some new soundtracks for where God wants us to go. I love what the Apostle Paul attached to this verse as well. He says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that just can't figure out what God's will is for their life. But the scripture shows us that it begins with renewing the mind. Uh, some of the old thoughts that you and I have are around what? Uh, failure. Thoughts like, uh, I always mess up everything. I'm such a failure. Uh, why would I even try something new? Or maybe it's around social settings. Uh, nobody likes me. 
Uh, I'm, I'm lonely. Uh, uh, the people here are, are weird. How many times have we had thoughts about an environment that we've yet to even enter? That we've just assumed this is just what it's going to be. Uh, some of us can have some of the same old negative thoughts around a career assessment. I'll never be successful. This is impossible. Uh, some of us have some negative old thoughts on repeat around anxiety. And, and the thought we keep telling ourselves is, I can't handle this. It's too overwhelming. And what I want us to consider this weekend is what if we replace some of those old, repetitive, negative thoughts with, with some new positive thoughts like, hey, I, I may face challenges, but I can learn from them and I can improve from them. Yeah, I, I know it's hard to make new friends in your 40s and 50s and 60s, but it's possible. And I can nurture meaningful connections with others and I can create new life-giving friendships. No, I mean, yeah, it'd be easy. Man, I'll never get anything done. But, you, but what if you had a new thought that just said, hey, oh, with a little confidence, a little discipline, a little hard work and some perseverance, I, I can achieve my goals. Sometimes we're thinking the thought, why me? But what if you started thinking the thought, no, why not me? No, I can take things one step at a time. I can grow. I can ask for help if, if I need to. Because I think when, when you and I begin to have the I can't mentality, I can't take it, I'm overwhelmed. Yeah, that's a thought. But it's an old one on repeat, especially when facing overwhelming circumstances. B bad news from a doctor or trying to accomplish some audacious goal that we think is way beyond our abilities. And so the old thought is you can't. But a new thought might be, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Maybe I can't on my own, but with Jesus, I can do a lot. I can do it. I can make it. I can get through it. You might be here today thinking, ah, I can't break this addiction. You're right. You can't, but Jesus can. And with him, you can do the impossible. Ryan, I can't do another day in this marriage. I know things are tough, but with Jesus, you'd be surprised what can turn around. Ryan, I can't handle all this change at my job. We have more work than bodies to handle it all, and that's very real for you. But remember, it's a repeated old thought that isn't adding any value to your life or your job. So you might as well try a new one. Uh, here, here's a new thought. Um, my job is hard right now, but with Christ, I can do all things. You want to know what's included in all things? A hard job. Boom. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I know you feel like you can't, but perhaps you turned on church today. You stepped into church today to get a little strength to be able to pull off what you think you can't. You may not be able to stop overthinking overnight, but with a little intentionality, I believe that you and I can make some serious strides in the right direction. You may not be able to fix all your past thoughts, but you can think a new thought today. The second need that I believe that our thoughts have is uh, number two, uh, leadership. Our thoughts need leadership. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What I want you to consider doing in a small group this week, or maybe you do this as a family, is taking inventory, writing down a list of your core thoughts that you're having on a daily, weekly basis. And I just want you to look at them objectively, almost as if you're looking at somebody else's thoughts. And consider, who's in charge here? Who's in charge of these thoughts? I think our thoughts desperately need leadership. And when we really consider who's in charge of our thoughts, there's a few options. God, which would be great if, 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 if that's the case. His word, that would be a great channel to say, okay, this is something that is directing our thoughts, but some other things that can be in charge of our thoughts are social media, uh, X, 
the artist formerly known as Twitter. I don't know what's going on, but, uh, but it can steer someone's thoughts. It can lead someone's thoughts. So maybe it's ESPN. Maybe it's a teacher, a, a news channel. Our thoughts are consistently being led in a direction, whether we know that or not. Someone, something, somebody is always in charge. But the good news is, if we take our thoughts captive, then our thoughts won't take us captive. So one of the ways that I think we give our thoughts leadership and take them captive is actually by analyzing our thoughts with a couple of questions. First one is this. Uh, is it true? Is it true? Uh, this goes back to what Jason talked about earlier in this series. He said, behind every sin we've committed is a lie we believe. Now, what I know about a lot of the lies we believe and some of the thoughts that are very negative is that uh, sometimes our most negative, false thoughts have extremes. Uh, it sounds like this. I always mess up. Everything always goes wrong for me. People never listen to me. People never show up for me. But here's what I've learned. Always and never are almost always never true. Think about that for a second. <laughs> always and never are almost always never true. The truth is, sometimes we mess up. The truth is, sometimes things go wrong for you. The truth is also, sometimes things go right for you, but perhaps you don't always focus on that. The truth is, there are some people who may ignore you, but not all people. Some people. Some people, perhaps, at times, may have disappointed you. But what I guarantee you is, all mankind has not conspired together to abandon you. I know that for a fact, because none of us are that important. <laughs> so I'll just tell you one of the negative thoughts that can be on repeat that I know isn't true. Uh, Ryan, you're a bad dad. I know it's not true, but it's a thought that can get real loud. And then I spiral. One missed practice, one missed bed time slash bath time, one bad grade. Uh, I tend to take my kids' words and behaviors so personal so much that I'll fall asleep with guilt and they'll fall asleep with peace. They're at peace with their life. I'm not at peace with their life. It's like I'm the one going to bed with thoughts of why I'm falling short as a parent. And, but here's what's funny. I, I've yet to meet a parent who said the following. Ryan, I'm killing it as a parent right now. I just, <laughs> man... <laughs> I got some things going on that I can teach you. I can show you the ropes, man. I can, I'm doing a course. It comes out this fall. Like, like nobody says that. It's like the more parents I talk to, it's like they all feel like they're missing the mark. And then I just, I just think to myself, like, are we all doing that bad? You know what I mean? Like, we can't possibly be doing that bad. And so when someone comes over to our house and, and it's a mom, she's like, I'm just such a bad mom. It's easy for me on the outside to go, well, it's not true. And uh, I actually, I actually can, can, can prove that because let, let's, just, let's, just, let's, just, let's just walk through that a little bit. Okay, you, you come to the conclusion, hey, I, I'm a bad parent, I'm a bad mom, bad dad. Okay, well, let's grade that. How is bad mom, bad dad, how is that measured? Okay, by a couple things. Uh, public hygiene, perhaps? Okay, that's fair. They need to smell and look good for public appearance. It's not much to ask. But what happens when they fart? Boom, you got an F. You see how that happened? <laughs> see, I just poked a hole in it. Automatically, you're a bad parent right now because they had some cheese the night before. Had a little pizza. Now here we are. <laughs> I mean, is it the first day of school photo? Do you have to have the proper signage and a green screen behind them with the exact, like, like what is it? Like, are, are we grading your parenting on what you post on the first day of school? Is it their grades? Keyword, their grades, but somehow as a reflection of ours? Nah, dude, this is your F. I graduated. I am done, okay? <laughs> I mean, is it their relationship decisions? Are we, are we grading our parenting on their money decisions? Perhaps their parenting decisions when they're parenting our grandchildren? Their relationship with the Lord? And how do you measure that? Bible reading? What are you doing? Checking their Bible app to say, oh, let me see what you read lately. You know, like, 
Is it Bible reading? Is it Bible studying? Do they have to be in a small group and go on a missions trip in order for you to be a good parent? Do they got to baptize one of their friends in a lake just, just for you to feel like you're doing something? Well, like, also, who's grading us? Who gets to pass out the parental grades at soccer? Other parents, they're just as jacked up as we are. They don't count, you know? <laughs> Who qualified you, buddy? You think a couple of Capri Suns made you the, 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 the parent guy? Like, come on, get out of here. Do our kids get to give us the grade? They're kids. What do they know? I mean, it all sounds silly, but that's my point. Some of our most negative thoughts, when you think about it, it's actually all pretty silly because it's a tall order to be graded on. Forget tall. It's an impossible order to be graded on. It's an impossible expectation to live up to and check all of those boxes and for all of that to fall on your shoulders. Bad mom, bad dad just isn't true, mostly because it's not even fair. Perfection cannot be the standard for parenting. Effort could be. Are you trying to be a perfect parent or a godly parent? Because a godly parent simply wakes up and leans on a heavenly father before leaning on anything else to help them create a household that honors God and honors other people. I love what Philippians 4 verse 8 says. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Um, I've got another question for you that I think will help give leadership to our thoughts. It's simple. What's good? <laughs> What's good? What the Apostle Paul is encouraging the church in Philippi with is choosing the direction of their thoughts. He is not in denial of reality, but he's encouraging them and us to fix our thoughts on things that are positive, on what's good. I know your marriage isn't perfect, but what's good about it? I know your spouse isn't perfect, but what's good about them? I know you might be in a frustrating single season, but what's good about this season that you may not be able to enjoy in another I know your boss may be difficult to work for, but what's good about them? You might be difficult to lead, but what's good about you? Think about it. I know it may be tough thinking about going back to school, but what's good about it? I know your organization might be going through a lot of stuff and a lot of change, but what's good about it? It takes no work to think negatively. But I encourage you to be a literal thought leader. Do the work and actually look for what is good. Look for what is true and noble and right and lovely and excellent and praiseworthy. Walk around your job that drives you crazy and say, you know what? I've decided to be a person that will look for the good and look for the person treating people with kindness and, and look for somebody that is bringing a positive energy to this environment. I'm going to choose to think about and actually even give a shout out to them. Contrary to popular belief, you don't need positive environments to adapt positive thinking. You could be watching this message from prison right now and still have positive thinking. Why in the world would I believe that? Because the guy who wrote the most scripture about positive thinking wrote it from prison. So do not wait for your circumstances to change, for your thinking to change. You're a thought leader. You're built different. You're the kind of person that we could put in any environment with the ability to look around and think. What's good here? The last thing that I think our, our thoughts need is uh, number three, uh, community. Our thoughts need community. Uh, there is a story in the book of Acts that I think is absolutely powerful. Paul and a guy named Barnabas are in a city called Lystra, where they see a man who has been disabled since birth. The apostle Paul looks at the man and says, stand up on your feet. And immediately 
this man jumps up and begins to walk. A miracle happens. Now, what's interesting is, is the people in this city are in such shock. They said, the gods have come down among us in human form. People freaked out, okay? They got so crazy, they decided to throw a parade for Paul and Barnabas, and they actually started bringing out bulls to sacrifice to these guys. And Paul's like, whoa, 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 you people have lost your minds. We're not gods. We're here to tell you about the one true God. But that did not stop this crowd at all. They're like, no, we're going to throw a party. You're a God. They did not stop this crowd from deifying. Now, Acts 14, 19 says this. It says, then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. This is not going well for the apostle Paul. Now, when it comes to stoning, uh, there's apparently levels to it. Some people think of stoning as an activity similar to dodgeball, you know, and you can't get out the way. You don't want to get hit by a rock. Like, that's what most people think about when they think about stoning. But what a lot of scholars uh, consider the most common form of stoning in Scripture was actually when someone would push you off a cliff, and then they would drop massive stones onto you. It's another level of, of stoning. That's being stoned. So, like, when you see that in Scripture, don't think of dodgeball. Think of being literal at rock bottom, and then someone dropping rocks on you. I wasn't there for this stoning, so I'm not sure which level of stoning we're dealing with here, but whatever kind of stoning Paul went through, we do know it was deadly. Now, I just want you to imagine that for a minute. I want you to imagine what he was thinking, trying to be obedient to who God's called him to be. And now he's being stoned to at least almost death. Just imagine his thoughts with each blow to his body. Why am I even doing this? Has God forsaken me? Has God forgotten me? Now, I'm trying to imagine, but I actually can't imagine that pain. I actually can't imagine that torment. I can't imagine the thoughts he would have to endure for the ministry God called him to. But the next part of the story changed my life. Acts 14, verse 20 says, But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into town. He got back up. This is better than Rocky. This is, this is awesome. Left for dead. Everyone thinks the story's over. Most people don't make a comeback after being stoned, except Paul isn't most people, and neither are his friends. No, Paul had a group of believers that surrounded him, and he got back up. I can't imagine being stoned for my faith and being left for dead, but I can't imagine what it would look like to be surrounded by a bunch of faith people and a bunch of faith friends who were willing to call on God for my behalf. Now, I used to wonder what Paul was thinking, but it doesn't matter because in this story, it only mattered what his friends were thinking. His friends were thinking, we're not going to let you die. We are not going to let you give up. And then they prayed like their lives depended on it. Now, here's what the scripture doesn't say. That I believe with all my heart, given the results of what the scripture does say. He got up and went back into the town. I'm pretty logical. So in my mind, I'm thinking, if I got a friend that gets stoned to what we think is death, I pray as hard as I possibly can, and they are revived. When they get back up, I hug them and say, hey, man, they almost got you, bro. <laughs> that was close. That was close. <laughs> hey, man, let's get, go get something to eat. You know, dust, you know, wipe the dust off his shoulders. Hey, man, lucky, you, I, lucky for you, I was here to resurrect you in time, man. This is awesome, man. Lucky you, Paul. Now let's get out of here. They're trying to kill us. Nope. Not these friends. I don't know what they said to Paul. But whatever happened in that community gave Paul the strength to go back into the town where they just tried to kill him. Now can you imagine what would happen if you and I were surrounded with those kinds 
of faith, friends. Can you imagine what we could overcome if we were surrounded by those kinds of faith, friends? Man, that would be awesome to have some people that when the chips were down, they surrounded us and we got back up. But what I want you to know is for us to be in the position to be surrounded by those kinds of faith, friends. We have to start by being those kinds of faith, friends. Young person, getting ready to go back to school. Don't be a good friend. Be a faith friend. Be the kind of faith friend that helps people get back up, that helps people face bullies, that helps people deal with gossip and pressures and challenges. And when people have lost their way and they don't know what to think, be the kind of friend that helps them stay on track with what and who God has called them to be. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the greatest gift that you can give a friend is to help them remain mentally organized. It's to be the kind of friend that says, whoa, 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 you, it seems like you're a little anxious about this. When I know you really want to trust God. So I know it's a thought, but uh, let's, let's get back to center a little bit. Hey, I know you, you, you feel like you're not good enough, but I, I can just, I actually can name several instances where you actually were good enough. I can't tell you how many friends I talk to that just have just these crazy expectations on their life. And I just, I just love to be that kind of friend that just says, hey, uh, so where do these expectations come from? And who's forcing you to do all of this stuff? Daniel Young, who's a, uh, the pastor of student ministries here at Eagle Brook Church, he, uh, he does this for me a lot. I'll be on the phone with him, just be asking me questions about how I'm doing and what's kind of the latest, and, and he will often kindly interrupt my thoughts and say, whoa, Ryan, is that true? And in a moment, I just think, I needed that. I can't tell you how many times I've just felt weak, tired. And Daniel Young will come in the back room here at the church and he'll just lay hands on me. You know, say, God, will you help my friend to clear your words today? It's happened multiple times when I needed it the most. My wife does this for me. She does it for other people as well. I'll hear her just pacing in the kitchen on the phone with somebody and I can literally hear her out loud rearranging someone else's thoughts to align those thoughts with what God thinks about them. She'll say, this is not how it's going to be forever. This is how it's going to be for a season. Don't mistake the temporary for the permanent. I said, babe, you writing sermons over there? What's going on? I need, can I get on the phone? Can I call you? Like, what's going on here? This is a two-way street. You need a friend in your life that can interrupt your thoughts. When they're going the wrong direction. And you need to be a friend that does the same for others. Daniel Young and I and some friends, we were out to eat this summer at old Chicago, eating pizza one night. And I, I love asking people if they have anything going on in their life that I can pray for. So I look at the waiter and I say, hey, man, uh, you got anything going on in your life that I can pray for? And, and he shared a few things. I was like, hey, man, you know, we'll pray for you. And then Daniel Young says, well, let's take it to another level. He stands up from the table and lays hands on this guy. I go, hey, man, you're making a scene. I'm like, dude, I didn't say do all this. Like, you're taking it to another level. And so he starts praying. So I just bowed my head and closed my eyes because I was so nervous. I was like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? I was like, yeah, 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 Jesus, yes, please help this brother, whatever his name is in this game. And so I've got my head down, eyes closed, and we're praying. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and I look up. And when I look up, a waitress has stopped serving her tables to come over and join us in praying for her colleague. And I thought, Whew, don't we all need that? Don't we all need somebody in our life to stop what they're doing, to pause their life just for a moment, to come care about us? And then I thought, can't we all be that? Can't we all call a timeout every now and then and go, are you okay? I don't know all that was going on in this waiter's life, but I know this waitress knew more than we did, and she decided that being in his corner was more important 
than serving another slice of pizza. Left on our own, I think our thoughts will spiral out of control. But with a few faith friends around us, I think you and I can face the impossible. In summary, number one, our, our thoughts need renewal. Those same old thoughts aren't adding value to your life. You and I both get 6,000 each day. So my hope and prayer for you is that you would be the kind of person that says, you know what? Why don't I try some new thoughts? And I wonder what would happen in your life and for your soul if you did. Secondly, our thoughts need leadership. I would not be the person that just wakes up and says, well, I'm just going to think what I think. I'm just going to let myself just think what I think. No, steer your thoughts in a direction. Open up God's word. Go, no, I, I, I need some new thoughts. And I actually want my thoughts to go in a very specific direction. What's good? Yeah, I want to look for what is praiseworthy. I want to look for what's excellent. I want to look for what is noble. I want to look for the good. I'm actually going to choose the direction of my thoughts. And lastly, our, our thoughts need community. We encourage you to be in a small group all the time. That's not for us. It's for you. It's for your thoughts. And when somebody in your world and mine loses their way and their thoughts are out of control, may you and I be the kinds of people that stand in their corner and help them find their way home. God, I thank you so much for this amazing church. I pray, God, that with the 6,000 thoughts we're going to have today, Lord, we surrender those to you. <laughs> would you help us to think like you a little bit more? Lord, would you give us some new thoughts? Would you be the leader and guide of what we think about ourselves, about others, about the world around us? And God, I pray that you would have a community of people, a community of faith friends that when we lose our way can help us get back on track. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the ability to be the kind of friend that helps others remain mentally organized. May we be the kind of faith friend that helps people face their darkest day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, our prayer team is going to be down here at the front. We'd love to pray with you if you've got anything going on. And uh, next week, we start a brand new series, That's So Mega Church, talking about some misconceptions that I think you're going to love. So, hey, we can't wait to see you next week. Have a great weekend.